today designing modern board games based on George Philly's forthcoming book, A Class in Board Game Design, Lecture 9, Styles and Mechanisms. So this is Lecture 9, and I'm going to begin by discussing mechanisms and styles. A major part of what I discuss is going to be focused specifically on the notion of economics, that is, we have business games, we have economic games, we have pr various levels of production, we can sort through them and tell what is going on, and this is an important distinction since the game you're supposed to be working on is eventually going to be involved with economics. I'll also say some more about cooperative games, but let us go back to the beginning and let us start with the distinction between mechanism and style. And a mechanism is a, a reasonably detailed process for how you execute a game mechanics. Now you can say there is a game mechanic, there will be um, spell casting, it's Dungeons and Dragons or Champions or the like, and that's a very general description. On the other hand, if you say there are hit points and spell points and saving throws and tables and you go through details, we are now getting down to the level of mechanism. A style is not the same as mechanism. Style could be said to be the, the fundamental central game of mechanics. Uh, however, if I ask what is the difference between style and mechanism, well if I have bidding for example, it may be that there, you bid a couple of victory points to get your choice of side at the start of a huge game and that's a play balance mechanism. On the other hand, we may have a game in which masterpieces, um, in which, gee, bidding is what there is, and that's what the game is about. And there are then various clever schemes uh, to gain an advantage in a bidding operation. Um, so if we are trying to draw a distinction, in a certain sense, we have a list of mechanisms and we have a list of styles and for the most part the two lists are identical except the one is a list of mechanisms and one is a list of styles and you want to keep straight what you're talking about now you might legitimately ask well are there styles that are not mechanisms and I am going to remind you of a few of these because there are styles like abstract Chess is abstract, Go is abstract, any card game in Hoyle, more or less any traditional uh, folk game is abstract. Well, we could argue about whether Natafel, Fox and Geese is abstract or not, um, but at the bottom end, it's a style of game. Similarly, media conversion a process of moving player money to attorneys for the contract negotiations. Media conversion is really a style. Uh, I suppose you could come up with a mechanic which you could insert into a role-playing game. It's hard to see how you do it in a board game where the mechanic is media conversion. But media conversion is really a style of game. It's a way you do things. Oh yes, supplements. Supplements are add-ons. And so we have a traditional Wild West gunfight game, bang. And people are equipped with six shooters or rifles or shotguns. And then we start adding the supplements. And we pick up things like Gatling guns, howitzers, Curiously, none of these are much more effective than pistols and rifles because they're not supposed to unbalance the game. But you add things that make the game larger. Now, there is an interesting piece in terms of discussing supplements, and this is, you can find this in the interview 
with Brett Morell and his game Duel of Agents, which we've mentioned before because Morell had a specific objective in ter terms of defining the depth of the game. And the notion is we come out with the original game, and if it turns out to be popular, we publish more items, and by publishing more items, we increase the sale, the, our income. And so, for example, there was the original little plywood box with Dungeons and Dragons in it, and then someone came out with Greyhawk, and someone else came out with Elvish Flummery. Oh, wait, that's not quite exactly the right title. And someone else decided, this is all the same company, to come out with Barsoom, which is based on John Carter of Mars, because they didn't realize the uh, rights issues were still active. Um, the original author of the Tarzan and Barsoom and so on series lived to a very old age. So there were, there were some amusing rights issues. So that one is very hard to find. However, you issue supplements. Coming back, however, to Morell, Morell had the bright idea, I am going to publish a game. Clearly, if I publish the supplements as time goes on, I am going to do very well indeed. So I will make the conscious decision. We will design the supplements at the same time we are designing the game. And this avoids all sorts of interesting ways you can write yourself into a corner and find it very difficult to write yourself out again. Of course, you can always say, we have decided to change the earlier rules, and this annoys some players no end. Morell designed all of the supplements at the same time he designed the original game, and therefore everything was reasonably coherent. Uh, the disadvantage of this, of course, is everything was designed at the same time. That's a huge amount of designer time locked up. That's capital locked up, not going into production. That's a financial challenge. Okay, then there are other classic games. There are games that don't have any luck at all, like Candyland. There are party games like Charades. There are jigsaw puzzles. We've talked about them. Uh, there are riddle games, and of course you can have riddle games like Trivial Pursuit. You can also have classic riddle games which are actually fictional devices as seen in novels like The Hobbit. What do I have in my pockets? Or perhaps Glory Road, that was Heinlein. Um, and then of course if you want something that really is a style rather than a mechanic, you are going to say, we are going to make a solo game, and the other side in the game will be played by an artificial intelligence. Now, if you play computer games, which more or less all of you do, the notion of an AI playing one side is, well, fairly familiar. Uh, designing an artificial intelligence, namely a set of paper rules that execute the play for one side, while the human being executes the play for the other side, is much more challenging. And one can readily point at games where, if you read carefully the AI rules, it was very amusing to hack the AI, and the AI would do exactly what it was supposed to do. Uh, for example, there was a game on the um, first of the major invasions of Japan that fortunately didn't occur, and here is the Japanese island that was going to be invaded. And the notion is we were going to invade here and at least push the Japanese off much of the island. Uh, this was Coronet, I forget. Uh, in any event, uh, the rule was the Americans landed and all of the Japanese units immediately march on the American landing. The Americans really only get one big landing so they don't have to worry about leaving their um, rear vacant. And the AI plays the Japanese army descending on the American landings. We make the American landing. We dig in and fortify massively. All of the Japanese units march straight at the American invasion. And when they're done with this, the AI has dutifully vacated the south 90% of the island, or whatever it was, of American units without any American attacks needing to be made. It's an AI. It's hackable. It's a finite, more or less, state game. It's sol it turned out this one has a solution that a human being can find. Um, 
So that is solo versus AI. And I have now discussed several styles of games that you would somewhat hesitate to say are really game mechanics. Now we will advance and we will discuss mechanisms and mechanics. And you may wonder, what is the ordering I am using in discussing mechanisms? And the answer is, I am going to start with the mechanisms that are significant because they're in the game specification for the game that you are designing. And so you will at least have heard some version of what should be going into the game. So let us consider a few mechanisms. And the first we consider are cooperative games. Now, it is extremely easy because there was a school of thought for games for much younger children, like first or second grade, that you designed purely cooperative games. And if you arrange things correctly, this did not hurt the little delicate little egos of the first and second graders. Um, those of you who have had to interact with first or second graders, now that you're more or less grown up, will have some hesitation about some features of this. Um, but in any event, it is possible to design cooperative games whose major feature is that they are so incredibly tedious that no one would possibly be interested. However, you can also design good cooperative games. And if you design good cooperative games, there is a piece where you all have a common objective, but it's still interesting. Now, one way to do this is shown in Vanished Planet, the game which unfortunately has now gone out of print, in which it is you versus the galaxy devouring monster. The galaxy devouring monster is played by an AI. However, the galaxy devouring monster strategy is every turn, move one square closer to the planet owned by each of the species in the game. And it has tentacles reaching out in all these directions. And after a certain number of turns, it will get to that point and eat the planets. Um, there, is a, there is a weapon which stops them, but it appears that no one planet can develop the resources to build enough mines to stop the creature from eating them permanently. They can only, you can only slow it down. So in any event, you have a cooperative mechanism and it's either we all win or we all lose. It is sort of like being in the leaking boat in the storm in the middle of the ocean. We all bail and either we win or it does. And that is certainly a cooperative mechanism, but it's a cooperative mechanism that does not really have a competitive part. Um, an alternative, sort of, is the German game in Siphon as crisis in the sign of the cross. This is a currently politically somewhat incorrect um, game about the Christian crusades for the liberation of the Holy Land from the Islamites, the Jews, the pagans. There was this long list and we are fortunately pre-reformation or the Christians would be talking about liberating it from each other as well. Um, in any event, the notion of the game is you have armies and you march the armies in. And everyone is playing the same side. You each are a crusader army. But under some t conditions, as you draw cards, you are allowed to move Islamite armies as you see fit. Uh, motion is very slow. Um, Armies are raised and sustained by traditional schemes, namely you show up in a city and buy soldiers, or you show up in a city and um, pray, which builds motivation, or you show up in a city and loot it, which gives you more money but costs you motivation. Um, that is historically rather accurate. For example, in at least one crusade, uh, the um, crusaders looted and largely sacked the city of Byzantium, which was the capital of the Byzantine Empire, which you would have thought would have been on the same side. Um, but the net result is, in the end, you are trying to take the city of Jerusalem, which has a rather large garrison, 
and it is probably the case that no player by him or herself will have an army sufficiently large to pull this off. Instead, what gets done is that one player after the next has to attack the city of uh, Jerusalem to liberate it, uh, and each time you attack, yes, they take casualties, you take casualties, and the trick is to be there and be the player that launches the last attack and liberates the city. And you can be grateful to the people who assisted you. So it's cooperative. You actually have to cooperate. But it's sort of like, what was the card game? Old Maid. In the end, someone gets stuck with the cards, someone doesn't. Maybe Hearts, that's another similar card game. And you attempt to arrange things so that you're the person who wins and the other people don't. That's a cooperative game with um, G, a single winner. Other cooperative games, well, there's always Terra. And Terra, you are proceeding through the game. And as time goes on, there are various impending or serious crises because you are pulling cards, and every so often you hit a crisis card. And the objective is to play enough pawns, expend enough meeple to stop the crisis. And if you do not succeed in stopping the crisis, it gets worse. And by the way, you lose all of the meeple you expended trying to stop it early on. Now, the issue is that the number of meeple you have to expend to stop a crisis is more than you are allowed to play. So you're in the interesting position, well, I, we need six meeple to stop this. I can play a maximum of three. Now, if I play three and everyone else plays one, I get points for being the first person to play. I get points for having expended the most meeple. On the other hand, if I put down three, and you guys all sit there and don't put any down, yeah, the crisis gets worse, but I lose my pawns. On the other hand, if the crisis is solved, the meeple can be recovered, at least for some of us. So it's a cooperative game, but Gee, do you really want to cooperate and help someone else to win or not? Uh, you notice the game is also sort of negative sum. That's the opposite of shape that you find in a traditional Euro game. In a traditional Euro game, the notion is you make decisions, but all decisions are positive sum. It may help you more, but it will help other players. You saw that in Puerto Rico. If you were paying attention in Puerto Rico, uh, you take a roll, and except for Prospector, which is the default if you just don't have anything you want to do, except for Prospector, you take a roll, you get a benefit, but everyone else gets to do things too. That's positive sum. Uh, if you have some cooperative games where you have to cooperate or bad things happen, sometimes they're negative sums. I have also previously mentioned in a different context, Europe, 1945-2030, which is a political game <coughs> in which you are attempting to arrange to get majority control of the political apparatus of each of one country at a time. In general, in order to get a majority, you need a coalition, and there are rules for forming coalitions and how points go to the benefit of everyone in the coalition. A reasonable player will notice at some point you have to make multi-turn multi deals past the future. Um, if you aren't successful, there are various unpleasant events that can come to pass, like major wars. Um, which you would not want under modern conditions. So you have a cooperative game, except there's some competition, because you're all getting points as you work to the cooperative objective. Um, so as I say, the notion in a cooperative game is that there is a common victory condition, and there is also an individual victory condition. Now we come to a design issue. And it's a design issue which is not actually in the book because several of your classmates a few years ago had to identify that it was a problem and um, <clears throat> find the solution in rewriting the rules. And the rewrite is we have, say, a five-player game. 
and I am player number four. And the requirement is that every, in order to get, satisfy the cooperative <coughs> condition, everyone has to build a house. And I have noticed I am clearly lagging behind in how many million dollars I've piled up. So I serve an ultimatum. We only have a certain number of turns to go. And either you will make me the winner, or I will not build a house, and we will all lose. The traditional version of this is the story of the um, crocodile and the um, scorpion facing some major river in some part of the world. This is a big scorpion. And the scorpion wants to cross the river. And the crocodile says, but if I take you across the river, you will sting me and kill me. And the scorpion says, but if I sting you and kill you, we will be out in the water and I will then drown. So obviously I won't do that. The crocodile falls for this line and they start swimming out in the river. And then the scorpion kills the crocodile. And when the crocodile asks, what is the point? The scorpion answers, you're going to die first. See, I win. <laughs> well, uh, this is not <laughs> a positive outcome of designing a cooperative game. Yes, the rule is literally cooperative. But because of the way you've set it up, gee, um, it's what is called the kingmaker problem. And what you want to do is design the game in such a way that disgruntled players who are going to lose, uh, if they are in, cannot by themselves completely kill the game. Or if you also want to rig it so that one or two players by themselves cannot satisfy the quote unquote cooperative condition and win. Uh, I am reminded of a variant on the traditional diplomacy game. Uh, it was supposed to simulate not late 19th century um, Europe to some extent on a synthetic map. Except if you paid attention, one of the countries in the game had more resources of every sort than every other country put together. And therefore, while it might have been viewed as a simulation, though not a very accurate one, and if you said it's a cooperative game, you jointly have to have a majority of control. Uh, one country started with the victory conditions already satisfied. Um, not a good game design, but we had any, uh, any number of years later, we were still ribbing the designer about his brilliant design. Um, especially when he proposed that he should be allowed to take the powerful country. can't imagine where he came up with that. Okay, so let us push ahead. And that's cooperative. And after you've played um, con uh, Conquest of the fall Fallen Lands, you will see an example of a purely um, cooperative mechanic, which really does make it a cooperative game. But it's a cooperative game in which cooperation is sort of not voluntary. Namely, uh, I have my army here, and we are going to invade that territory. And each of you uh, who have armies bordering, when you hear me say, charge, your armies will follow me. It's cooperative. You, don't, you can't stop them from helping me. So it's a cooperative mechanism of a very clever sort. Let us push on to discuss economics. Now, Wednesday, we are going to be playing an economic game in laboratory. The game is brass. Um, the nominal estimated playtime is two to three hours. We have not used the game before, so you did not hear me predict this is how long it will last. I am not going to, this time, I am not going to teach you how to play the game, so you will all hopefully have acquired or your group will have acquired a copy of the game decently in advance and be able to have gone over the rules and read it. You may be able to find the rules on the internet, of course. You may find discussions of tactics on the internet. Hey, it's a big internet. Uh, someplace out there between the World Trade Tower was rammed by a flying saucer and the Earth is actually flat and NASA is publishing the fake photographs. You may even find game tactics that are actually correct. <clears throat> 
as opposed to planted game tactics to help opponents lose. <laughs> Would someone do that? Uh, well, anyhow, <clears throat> the answer is <coughs> we are going to be doing one of these. If it turns out that the game runs much shorter than estimated, you should try playing it a second time, and you should turn off all eco caps that limit economic growth. I will give a hypothetical example. We are building um, shipyards on the Tyne in Scotland to launch ships. Now, as a practical matter, Scotland is rather large. And it is extremely unlikely that by building shipyard after shipyard, I can pave Scotland with shipyards and run out of ship, shipyard space. However, it is not atypically the case that in games of this sort, you are limited to the number of counters in the game, the number of spaces for iron works or brass works or good no, goodness knows what. Um, and therefore, you can try, if you have the time, try playing it again with the caps turned off. You will get a demonstration of something called exponential growth uh, this is much less harmful in computer games where if I am playing Space Empire and I send out a fleet of 10,000 ships, yeah, the computer has to print a larger number on the screen. If I'm doing this as a board game and I suddenly need 10,000 or 9,000 unit counters, well, there is a board game with 9,000 unit counters. It's a Decision Games War in the Pacific. It's this big and it's heavy because they're all printed on solid cardboard. You do not want to think about a wooden block game with 9,000 counters. Uh, those of you who are not heavily athletic would need to show up with a forklift to move it. Not a good solution. OK, so we're going to talk about economic and business games. And to reemphasize where we are, we have business games in which the market does not care much about what you are doing. We have economic games where you are affecting the market. And then we have economic growth games which either have caps or which things can get out of hand if you don't say that the world ends after a few turns. Uh, a business game would be like any of us, as far as I know, any of us investing in the stock market. If we buy a thousand shares of U.S. Steel, nothing much, or General Motors, or whatever, nothing significant is going to happen to the price. Your parents may wonder for some of those where your year's tuition went, uh, but the fact that you dropped ten, a few tens of thousands into the stock market isn't going to do anything. On the other hand, if you are Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, and you look at, oh, Burlington Northern Railways, I need something to complement my train set. And so you buy a real railroad. Well, if you're Warren Buffett, he actually bought a railroad in which I had stock out from under me. Uh, you, not, you can make and create the price because you have tens of billions of dollars on hand. Um, and that would be an example of an economic game. You can influence or be the market. Um, so there's this distinction. A traditional business game in which you actually are making things uh, is the very old Avalon Hill game, Management. You play the game, you have a certain number of factories and a maximum that you can build. Uh, you have actually only two, design, two choices in the game. And one choice in the game is whether you stay with standard factories or go to automated factories. And the other choice is whether you decide to um, give the workers a raise or to have the workers strike. Um, you can infer the political and managerial inclination of the fellow who designed the game from which of these is the right answer each time. Uh, and I have just told you all of the actual decisions you make in playing the game. And you, we could then ask, well, which of these is the winning strategy? And there's some, there are some answers to these. 
under modern conditions, oh, what were the prices of the goods? That is, you're making goods and it costs you money, so you have to pay the workers and buy the factories. And then there are the prices of goods which wander up and down because they're chance cards. And the chance cards don't care what you've done with to your workers. They don't care whether you've got good factories or clever factories. Uh, all they care about is the numbers printed on them. So in principle, if you wanted to settle permanently the question of what the strategies are, you generate a list of the chance cards. Uh, you tell the computer which, which you go through, the, there are only four strategies here, and you do a Monte, computer Monte Carlo simulation where you draw the cards in different orders each time, and you do say 10,000 or 30,000 different orders, and when you are done, you will know what the correct strategy is. You see, you can use computers to solve the game, except it's a stochastic solution. It's not like chess or checkers. Checkers has actually been solved. It's a draw. There is a known strategy which perhaps only a computer can execute, <coughs> though there was a human being who was as good. He's since passed away. And the strategy lets, guarantees a draw. On the other hand, um, for this game, because the cards show up in random order and you don't know what the order is in advance, well, the best you can do is a stochastic solution and you can determine whether one strategy is always better than the other or whether it's only mostly better than the other. I have not told you what the winning strategy is there, but it's a business game. Now, there are things you can do with business and economics games that are significantly more sophisticated uh, one way or another. Um, there is always, it's discussed in some detail in design elements, industrial waste. And the game gets its name because in addition to having factories and workers you have to pay and production costs and these other things, you also have the cost of cleaning up afterwards uh, just as you do in any modern industrial manufacturing arrangement. In fact, if you're doing this in German, built in Germany at one point, I don't know if this is current, built into the cost of the television, if you're the television maker, is the cost of disposing of the television when it's finally scrapped. And if you're unlucky, uh, there are whole big costs there. Okay, so there is a distinction between business and economic games. In economic games, what you do has an effect. You can, for example, imagine we are, I have a game, and one of the things I can do to raise money is to sell stock. Well, it could be that the price of my stock is random, in which case I try to time to sell when the price of the stock is high, not when it's low. Uh, this doesn't resemble reality very much. Uh, in fact, if I am running a company and I announce, well, to get our new plant into production, we're going to need some more cash than we anticipated. We're going to sell an extra hundred million shares of stock that we had. That's in the author. It's in the authorization. You've already voted for it. We hadn't planned on. We can anticipate our stock price will describe a certain curve particularly if it's not clear that the plant will be working afterwards either. Um, on the other hand, under more conservative conditions, you have stock, and the price of the stock is partly determined either by the size of the company or the growth of dividends. Dividends are the more traditional answer. You set aside dividends, meaning you have money that you generate. You, pay, have, you lose money to the central repository, that's called paying out dividends. And because you are paying out dividends, um, the price of the stock it goes up or is stable. Uh, Mr. Buffett, who we've mentioned, of course, uh, his stocks do not in general pay dividends. If you buy Berkshire, if it's not a dividend stock, you're investing in the growth of the company, which becomes more and more humongous with every year. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and you are investing in the fact that you own a chunk not of a $10 billion effort, but a 40 or an 80 or who heavens knows what billion dollar effort. Uh, you can, however, when we say economic game, also have something that I lump with economics, 
which is production. And we can sort of describe production in terms of levels. So let us start out with sort of zero level production. It's a gold mining game. And we st all start out in the central store, and the storekeeper, who is not a player because they're going to be the ones who are going to get rich. And we go out some distance, and there are tiles, and it's sort of like Carcassonne, except all of the tiles are placed in advance and they're upside down. And so I move out some distance, and there is a tile, and I turn the tile over, and printed on it is the amount of gold I pick up. And now, since I have to go back to the store every time, I go back and deposit it. And basically, if you look carefully, I'm picking up amounts of money at random. And this, is, this game, except the picture looks very different, this game is Candyland. And it's not Candyland with dice, it's Candyland with upside down tiles. But there's no production at all. The second choice, however, is that I pick up the gold and I take it back to the store and I can use the gold, which is a material item at this point, to buy items that allow me to produce more efficiently. For example, I go back to the store and I buy snowshoes or a dog sled or a canoe possibly not in the same season if you think about things. And because of this, I can go out farther and faster and carry more, and maybe I can bring more gold back. It doesn't have to be gold, but now I've added a step to the economics where because I am generating resources, I can use the resources to do so, build something else. Um, a simple example of this is found in the game Wallenstein. Uh, Wallenstein was a general of the Thirty Years' War period uh, who was eventually assassinated by his own side. Um, this is a charming period of human history. Uh, the Thirty Years' War is mostly noted for totally devastating all of Germany. Um, in any event, you have uh, two years, um, two level economics. Namely, you have territories. The territories can be persuaded. I am very much oversimplifying to produce grain and gold. The grain and gold is used to produce buildings, which you do not, if I recall correctly, exactly have to put in your own territories. And the objective of the game is to produce buildings. Oh, you can also use the grain and gold to fight conflicts in a certain sense. Um, I have never played the game. The warfare part didn't look very promising. The game is also notable, notable for the fact that it is very short. It is only six turns. And the point of very short games is sometimes you have a game that is not long, but the strategy is very deep and you want to think. Or you have a game that has to be played in a fairly short time sequence, but that doesn't mean it can't be tactical. It means you have to be clever to some extent. Um, we could do things that are more complicated. If we talk about Russian rails, that's one of the railroad games. And if you look at Russian rails, which you can certainly do, um, you discover you build track, railroad track, and if you build railroad track, you get shipping, which generates um, income. And from the shipping, you can buy more track. You actually have to buy it and then build it. And you now have a cycle where you are doing economic development that's a couple of layers deep. Um, so we could do that. Let's, on the other hand, consider a banished planet. having rather deep economics in number of layers. 
What do we mean? Well, you send spaceships out, or a spaceship, and you procure resources. And you can use the resources to generate personnel. And having generated the personnel, you have the personnel, you have the people, and you can do things with them. You can use the personnel to develop technologies. You see there's a tech tree hiding in there, sort of. And if you have the technologies, you can use the technologies to build parts. So you can do upgrades, and you can buy equipment and things and spaceships. And you notice one, two, three, four, and these don't show up automatically. You have to go out and find them. And now we have four level economics. A four level economics is going to get fairly clumsy to design and tune and balance, but it's in principle possible. So that's economics and economic levels, and we have gone from level to level, from one to four. I confess uh, that while I've worked on the notion of economic levels, there are a couple of little complications. Let's go back to Puerto Rico. And so we have things that produce goods, and you can use the goods for victory points. You can use the goods to procure money. And if you have money, you can use it to generate buildings. In particular, you can use it to buy hmm, additional refineries, this, thing, this sort of thing, that sort of thing. So how many levels is this? Now, the complication is that particularly the very clever variant that one of you came up with, if you have money, you can use it to short circuit the construction process. That is, if I have money, instead of um, uh, building something that makes resources, I might be able to buy resources from someone. If I have money, I can retain the services. Remember, this was the rules variant where only one person plays a role, so I can pay off someone to play a role for me. And suddenly life becomes much more complicated. Uh, how if I have a game with money, and the money can intervene at various levels in the pr production process, um, exactly how many economic levels do I have? And if you work through design elements, you will find that I redid things once. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I was really consistent in how I did it. And the answer is that economics is not quite as simple as it sounds. Surprise, if it were simple, we wouldn't be having the long recession, now would we? Um, so we try these variations and we ask where we go. There is one interesting other piece on economics here. That is, if I have a game with economics, and I can use A to build B, and B to build C, and bunches of different parts are needed at each stage, you can do fairly complicated planning as to how you get from A to richer than Curzius as fast as possible. And those of you who are fond of planning and advanced thinking will pull this off. Well, the reason you can do that is that you have perfect knowledge of what is going on and can do this planning. That was the basis of the economic theory that I describe in the book as Soviet command economics, where there is a ministry of planning that does everything. Uh, if you compare the um, standard of living in countries like Russia before it collapsed with the rest of the world, matters did not work as well. <coughs> If I use the phrase communism with Chinese characteristics, a few of you know exactly what I mean. And you notice it is not based on the assumption that a few people can predict everything and plan everything. It's based on the assumption that everyone is intelligent and does well. And real economics um, is sort of the opposite of this command economics planning that you get in games. You can do it in games, this is explained by Austrian economics, because you have perfect information and you know everything. Well, in the real world, you don't have perfect information. 
and you have interventions that may or may not work and markets that can give you good feedback and it's not at all like a game. But if you don't pay attention on that, you get into trouble. I guess we have pushed off exploration as a um, scheme and mechanic until next time because I see I am out of time and therefore we are done.